I would like to preach to you a message entitled, The Improbable and Impossible Christmas. The Improbable and the Impossible Christmas. Some of you are nursing colds as I am nursing a cold. And, uh, you know, this time of year, the weather doesn't know what it wants to do. And it doesn't know if the sun wants to shine or if it wants to snow. It hasn't gotten the snow idea yet, I guess. But uh, no more moaning. But uh, you know how that plays havoc on your brain and on your body. And I don't know what it is, but this time of year is a great one for colds. Let's go to the Lord, please. And I'd like to preach to you the improbable and impossible Christmas. Father in heaven, I just plead and pray that you would take this cracked and broken vessel Lord, I am nothing and you're everything. Lord, I am the bruised reed and the smoking flax, Lord, that you promised that you would not destroy. I just plead and pray, Father, that you would open the minds of the people today. I pray that you would be pleased to sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. I pray that you would be pleased to save some soul. I pray, Father, hang him over hell. Or let some man or some woman see themselves as totally depraved before God and crying out, Oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I pray, dear Lord, that the hallmark of Christmas would not get in the way of seeing the truth. I pray, Father, that this morning that we would refuse to leave this place until we have eaten of the bread of life, until we have become like the Lord Jesus. I pray, dear Father, that every seat would be awake pray that every young person would listen with desire. And Father, move me out of the way and let Christ stand here in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, there are some great miracles, some great miracles that God has accomplished in the Bible and even fairly recent in history. In 1948, there was a miraculous thing, that is, that Israel became, became a state. Nobody thought it could happen after the world wars, but it did happen, and we praise God for that miracle. Creation was a great miracle, wasn't it? Creation was a great miracle. I'll tell you, the plagues of Egypt, that, those were miracles. Wouldn't you like to have seen them? And I would have liked to have seen the fire come down on Mount Carmel. I would have loved to see it lick up, you know, that sacrifice and, and seeing Elijah, the great Tishbite man of God, calling down fire from heaven after 40 hours, those guys cutting themselves and all that, and says, all right, God, bang! That would have been a great thing. There have been some great miracles, but listen... All of those miracles that you know in the Bible and even that you have seen in your lifetime perhaps or even heard with your ears, they pale in comparison to the fact that God Almighty, Jehovah God, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the flesh of man. Amen. It pales in comparison any miracle in the word of God to the fact that God chose to become a man so that he may die for sinners. That, friends, is a great, the greatest miracle, the miracle of God's grace. This morning I want you to see two contrasting characters in the Christmas story. One struggle with the fact that God could do the improbable. He had great struggles with whether God could do the improbable. The other blossomed in great faith that God can not only do the improbable, but God can do the impossible. There is nothing too hard for the Lord, Amen. and there is no restraint to the Lord, and God can do whatever He chooses to do. <laughs> By the right. end of the message, it's my goal to convince you this morning, before Christmas morning, that if God can, can accomplish the miraculous uh, salvation incarnation, you know incarnation is, right? God in the flesh. If He can accomplish the miraculous salvation incarnation, He can can certainly accomplish the improbable and the impossible in your life today. Amen. What, what are those things to God? If you look, look in your Bibles, Luke chapter 1 and verse number 5, we did not have the advantage because of time to read this twice. I really like doing that to get it into your mind. So would you stand in respect to the Word of God? You're going to have to listen twice for once this morning. All right? And let it, we're reading a long time, so you just stand there and you listen. Here we go. There were, verse number 5, there was, excuse me, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Time out, look up here. It is almost probable that sometime in the message, because I'm using the name Zacharias over and over and over, that I'm going to call this guy Zacchaeus. 
Now, I would ask you to have great grace upon Pastor Whitmer, okay? Because in practicing this message and getting ready for it, I called him Zacchaeus multiple times. So when you hear this, please know he's not climbing a sycamore tree. He's standing in the temple and an angel is coming to visit him. All right, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife uh, was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no ch child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both now, or they were now, well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God, in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without uh, at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Remember that statement. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him, before the Lord, of verse number 16. Which, by the way, the Lord their God, he, John, shall go before him, who the Lord their God. John went before who? Jesus. Hence, Jesus is the Lord their God. And he shall go before, that's good, and he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias, that's Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto, uh, uh, said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well stricken, or well stricken in years. The angel answered, said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these things, these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, and remained speechless. And it came to pass as soon as the days of his ministration or the days that he finished ministering as a priest there in the temple were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee, same angel named Nazareth, to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art, uh, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, she was troubled as saying, and cast in her mind, What manner of salutation this should be? And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her, in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen. Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You may be seated. Here you see two individuals in the Christmas story, Zacharias and Mary. I'm going to need a little bit more on the monitors, please. They both were used miraculously of the Lord and, uh, to forward His great will and His salvation plan. Two people contrasting completely different answers, completely different attitudes, completely different hearts, Zacharias and Elizabeth. All right? Listen to me. These, both, these people were both peripheral people in the story of Christmas, but they were used in a tremendous way. Listen, you will never be listed in the Bible. 
You will never uh, have your name up in the hall of faith in Hebrews. But please notice that God worked then in miraculous ways and that God desires to use you in a way. Please understand that these here are used by God. And these are examples to us of how to be used by God and how not to be used by God. But the point is that God used them. All right, your life has a reason in God's sovereign plan. If you've been born again, God saved you that he might make you a part of his historic strategy and plan. You are a pawn that God is using on his universal chessboard. He's going to overcome Satan. He's going to win the day. He's going to win the final victory. Satan wins few battles along the way. God will win the war. And listen to me, you've got to realize that you, a child of his grace, you are a pawn on that great chessboard that God is moving. Right. You are being, you are affecting the outcome. You say, not me, I'm just a little fiddly handmaiden, 17 year old from a town nobody's ever heard of. I don't have any money. God doesn't even know about me. I'm poor, certainly. I'm not even married. Certainly he's not going to use me. You're not a number to God. He knows you by name, and he knows the number of the hairs on your head. The Bible says that he worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's not Pastor Whitmer standing up at this pulpit. That word of God says he's working in you both to will, to decide, and to do, to carry it out, his good pleasure. You are not placed in time just to be a nice little person. You're not placed in time to have a nice little job and have fun and die. There's a divine purpose to your life. Amen. There's a spiritual role for you to play. You will play that role willingly, or you will play that role grudgingly. And my question to you very straightly is, are, how are you going to play it? you going to play it like Zach, Zacharias. almost said Zacchaeus. <laughs> Zacharias, or are you going to play it like Elizabeth? Are you going to play it like Mary? Are you going to play it with those that understood that they were part of God's divine, divine plan, and they had faith towards it that way? There's a spiritual role for you to play. It is a great time that you can be a great servant of the Lord or you can be a doubting skeptic of the Lord. And you've got to decide what you want to do. The great miracle of Christmas is Jesus the Savior coming into the world. That is the big picture. Everybody understand that? There's no doubt that in this story of Luke chapter 1, are you with me? Some of you are in la-la land. You're having dances of fairy plum, whatever they are. They're, they're dancing in your head. All right? All right, listen. There's no doubt that the main story here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eternal God, coming to earth, the flesh. But I want you to understand, that's the big picture, the salvation of the world through Jesus Christ, the virgin birth. That's a big picture, but did you ever realize that he pulled it off through human characters? He used people like you to accomplish that task. And frankly, sometimes they weren't even godly people. Sometimes, like Zacharias, they weren't even faithful-filled people. They played a part. They had a purpose. They will forever bear how they reacted, either in embarrassment and shame of how they reacted, being used by God, or in great respect and great rewards in eternity because they reacted the right way. You know, there are Zacharias Christians here this morning, as you see in the first part of this story that I read. They spend their lives either struggling against God's will or questioning God's leading of them into an opportunity to be used by Him. They're always asking, God, are you really leading me? Oh, of course He's leading you. No, friend, friend, it's the devil that's calling you into the ministry. No, it's really the devil that wants you to do that ministry opportunity for Him. It's really the devil that wants you to hand out that track. It's really the devil that wants you to join SWAT. It's really the devil that wants you to sing in the choir. It's really the devil that wants you to, to use your gifts. No, that's not really God. I don't know if the Lord's really leading. I have this great burden to preach the word, but I think it might be my flesh. Yeah, it's your flesh. And these Zacharias Christians, they can't believe that God could use them, and they just sit around skeptical all the time, and they're dragging their, their uh, feet, and they've got the emergency brake on most of their life. God may want them to do something big or small, but they have no faith that God could or would use them. In fact, they don't even think of it a lot of times. Certainly won't use me. You know, there's no title of pastor in front of my name. Perhaps it's to reach the lost person at your work. Perhaps it's to be a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, a missionary, to be a faithful, godly dad, daddy that has some kind of backbone and some kind of convictions in a world where everybody's a jellyfish. Perhaps it's a, to sing in the choir, to use your gifts or talents for the Lord, whatever. 
And these folks drag their feet in allowing God to use them for his great purposes. They're skeptical that God could work the improbable in their life or through their life or the impossible through him. Certainly he can't do that. Then there's the married Christians in the story. That's not M-E-R-R-Y. That's M-A-R-Y. The merry Christians, as the last part here. This Christian realizes that they're unworthy. They look for opportunities to be used for God, like, like Mary. The great picture of God's grace and His salvation and His will. They are so attractive and so great. Those big, that big picture of what the angel says. The great picture of what God could do through Lighthouse. The great picture of what God could do in their life is so big, big that by faith they must have a part of it. They're not going to be a spectator. They've got to have a part. Coach, put me in. God, I want to be used. I've got one life. I've got 60-some, 70-some years, 80-some if I'm very, very fortunate. I've got one life to spend for you, Lord Jesus Christ. You spent all your life for me. I want to be put in. I want to make some kind of impact. If God can accomplish the miraculous salvation, incarnation, He can certainly accomplish the improbable and the impossible in your life and through your life. I want you to notice now, look at the word of God, the Zacharias Christian, the Zacharias Christian. In verse number 6, you can see, you can scan there, the Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth are saved. They're not saved because they were blameless. Listen, God justified them. He saved them. There's nobody on the earth that is blameless unless God says you're blameless. You're saved by grace. Amen. All right? The righteousness that was resting upon them is the righteousness that is resting upon you. That's, they were justified Old Testament saints. They were saved by faith, trusting in salvation outside of their commandments, their works, okay? That's who they are. Listen, salvation, excuse me, I said that backwards. Being used by God starts with salvation. Some of you, you really have a desire to be used from God, but you're not, you've not nailed down the salvation map. You've not nailed down that Jesus Christ is your only Savior. Listen, you can't even think about becoming a married Christian in our story unless you nail that down this morning. Why do you linger? Is it pride that holds on? You know that you're not saved. I was reading about the biography of John Bunyan this week. And man, Bunyan, he struggled for, for years. The guy who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, you know, he struggled with years about his salvation and, went, and never nailed it down. I mean, he, he, he felt the depths of hell. Listen, I did too when I was a little 10-year-old. If you feel the depths of hell and you know that you should plunge in, then you're going to plunge in. If you have not the salvation of the Lord God trusting in Jesus Christ, Finish it this morning. Get it? Amen. Finish so you can spend the rest of your days not to the will of the flesh, but to the will of God. Amen. Get saved. Get saved. Answer the call. The Bible says, He that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. There's nobody that ever came said, Lord, save me. I'm a wretched sinner. And God said, I ain't going to do it. Right. Everyone, everyone that ever comes to Jesus Christ shall be saved. Amen. You see God's word comes to Zacharias in verse number 13. Look at verse number 13. It says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy... That's an interesting statement. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Zacharias was one of 18,000 priests that at this moment was ministering for the Lord on a rotation basis. Two weeks out of every year for one week at a time, they would come to the temple and they would do their service one week at a time. That's what Zacharias is doing. Their jobs were to perform the daily sacrifices and burn incense. That's what he did. Now that he was in the outer place, the holy place, outer holy place, all alone by the, actually, the altar of incense, and this angel Gabriel appears at the right-hand side. Imagine what it was like. It's quiet. It's peaceful. Nobody else is allowed in there. You're going through your business, you know. Doing this. you got the incense. You're taking it. Banga! The angel of the Lord! Wow. He lost ten years right there. So did we. He lays out to Zacharias the miraculous of what God was going to do. He says, listen, Elizabeth... My wife? Yes, your wife. She's barren. Elizabeth! Elizabeth would bear us. We'll bear you a son, John. His name will be John. Let me back it up. Zacchaeus? Zacharias? Elizabeth? I will get everybody in this story correct, okay? Angel says to Zacharias, Elizabeth, your barren wife is going to bear you a son. His name is going to be called John. Zacharias, you're going to be the dad. Listen, this was not a divine inception. Zacharias was the physical, biological father. You can see that clearly if you read the rest of the story. 
Uh, that boy would be great in the Lord's sight. He would not drink alcohol. He'd be separated under the Lord's word. He would be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. You say, how does that? How do we handle that theologically? John was the last Old Testament prophet. Remember, the Holy Spirit did not indwell. Uh, the Holy Spirit came upon Old Testament saints. All right, that's how you explain that. Uh, John would turn, this boy would turn many Jews to the Lord their God. He would go before Messiah and the power of Elijah. He would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom. And uh, the people, he would prepare their hearts for the Lord. His whole baptism ministry of repentance was this. He was getting people to realize their sin so that when Jesus came, he could give them grace. And listen to me, there's nobody here that's going to throw up your hand in the invitation and say, okay, I feel like being saved. There's nobody at all. God's got to bring you to the place of repentance of your sin. You've got to see yourself over hell before you realize why you need a Savior. John was the forerunner of Christ, showing repentance. You must turn from your sins. Turn from your sins. God must, in His grace, give you the ability to see with your eyes that you're a dirty, rotten sinner before you can accept Jesus Christ as Savior. The angel told Zacharias the great miracle of grace God was going to do through His son, John. After hearing these great things, folks, are you with me? Are you still with me? Are you cooking your dinner? And after these great things, all Zacharias could say was, you're going to have to prove it to me. Please understand verse number 18. The Bible says, and Zacharias said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man. My wife is well stricken in years. In our lingo, that is very clearly, whereby shall I know this? How will you prove it to me? Because I really don't believe it. Or, as some of you smart Alex said, as a teen, it's miraculous because he couldn't get past the improbable. The improbable. Come on, people, an angel miraculously appears to him, tells him this boy, his son that was coming was going to be the second Elijah, forerunner of the Savior of the world. And all Zacharias could think of is, I'm too old to have a baby. Think about that. Angelic being standing in front of you. You don't have to prove that to me. I don't know. I'm, just, I'm just too old. Can't, sorry. You might wait for the next priest. Because, you know, it's not going to work for me. You know, it's obvious to me that Zacharias is just like us. Look at verse number 13. I pointed out twice, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Folks, Zacharias just say, said, you can't do what I've been praying for. Hello, Zacharias, why have you been praying at then? It's just like us when we pray, and we pray for something, and then it happens, and then Tom Pruitt gets uh, out of the hospital as we pray. Unfortunately, he's back in there this morning. I can tell you that, it's not really time for announcements. We pray that God can deliver somebody. God can save, save people, save people, save people. Last few weeks, three people came to Christ at Lighthouse. Amen. And when the answer comes, listen to me, the answer comes, you know what we say? Probably coincidence. <laughs> That's a good antibiotic. It's a good surgeon. I got a new way of doing. He's out of the hospital because the HMO wouldn't kick in. <laughs> We're skeptical like Zacharias. You can't do it. Prove to me you're going to do it. What have you been praying about, Zacharias? I've heard your prayer. And then it's answered. How can you do it? Folks, God can do the impossible. The kicker of this unbelief is this. Elizabeth having a child wasn't even impossible. It was only improbable. You know why? Because we know that priests retired at age 50. When they were 50 years old, they didn't have to minister anymore. So Zacharias was under the age 50. Zacharias, I'm not going to have any of you men or ladies stand. I would, I would assume that Elizabeth was around the same age or maybe a little bit younger. It is not impossible for a 50-year-old lady to have a baby. It's improbable, but not impossible. So I did a little search. I did a little search on January 17th of last year, 2005. A lady by the name of Adrienne Elusku gave birth to a healthy child at age 60. Six. Wow. You know, this was not an impossible thing. It was just improbable. But Zacharias could not believe even that God would do the improbable through him. Folks, God can not only do what seems improbable in your life, but he can and he will accomplish the impossible. There is nothing that God cannot do. 
There is nothing that God cannot do. There is nothing that God cannot do. He will never do the impossible in my life, Pastor Whitmer. That is skepticism. I'm not talking about some strange miracle, friends. I'm talking about providing all your needs and doing something that you cannot do. He's certain. Some of you can't even believe that he'll do the improbable. That you can't even believe that he'll provide money at a certain time in your life. You can't even believe that he'll bring back a child that's gone astray. Listen, that's not impossible. That's only improbable. God does the impossible. He is not limited by finances or time or space or human government, disease or whatever. In fact, improbability and impossibility doesn't even lower the chances of God doing something. There is no limitations right. to God. Listen to me. He does the he, he does what he pleases in the miraculous as well as he performs the mundane. That's right. A miracle to God is like you taking a cup out of your cabinet and turning on the faucets and getting a drink of water. It is nothing to God. The, the amount of money has no bearing on God. The, the, the situation where the person that you're praying for is so far in the sin has no bearing. The, the fact that you lost your job and never seem to be able to get it back, no bearing on God. He does whatever he chooses. You say, that's the problem that gets me. The problem is that he doesn't want to work in my life. Zacharias. Zacharias. God doesn't want to work in your life, and why are you saved? Amen. Oh, you little faith. You can trust him for your eternal soul, but you can't trust him for a bill that's due next week. Now, that's interesting. <clears throat> That's interesting, and I'm pointing all these fingers back at me. That's what's rough about preaching. You always feel like you need to get right. <laughs> Zacharias says, you're going to have to prove it to me. Hey, listen, is not an angelic visit enough to prove it? You know, God has been so visible in some of your lives, as visible as that angel standing on the right hand beside the altar of incense. He's been visible in provision for you. He's been visible in you have great families. He answers your prayer. You live in a house. You have food. He's been very visible in your life. Very visible. Gotten you out of scrapes and problems. And you're not sitting in a bar this morning. You're sitting in a lighthouse Baptist church. Amen. He's got a hold of your life. He's done such great visible things. You look at him and he's, you say, you've got to prove it. The least bump in the road, you say, God, prove that you can take care of this. I'm not sure you can handle the improbable in my life. Prove it. you got to love the frustration in verse number 19 as Gabriel, the angel, answers him back. And please understand that what he answers him is very important to understand. And please, in the, in the reading of it and the meditating on it, I certainly believe that there is frustration in Gabriel's voice. He was not sinning. It was a holy frustration. <laughs> And I believe that if you look back in the depths of the Greek language, and you looked in the depths of all how the words go together, you will certainly see that all these phrases that Gabriel answers, answers back to Zechariah start with, listen, bucko. <laughs> he says, listen, bucko, I am Gabriel. His name meant man of God. Dealing with authority, not humanity, I am the man of God sent to you. I am the authority of God standing before you. I stand all the time in the presence. Next phrase. I stand in the presence of God the Lord. Bucko! <laughs> Don't tell me God can't give you a piddly son. I see him from his throne run all of eternity. I stand watching. Bucko. <laughs> Looks, he must have looked at, at Zacharias like he was just a, 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 how do you have no faith in what God can do? He says, furthermore, God sent me to talk to you and tell thee, verse number 19 and 20, and tell you these glad tidings. I don't have to, listen it, listen, hear the tone. God sent me to tell you these things. I don't have to prove, don't wear by me, don't, how, how's it going to happen to me? I don't have to prove anything to you. God sent me. He told me it was going to happen. And his word always comes true. His promises Amen. are sure to your life, Zacharias, and the congregation of Lighthouse Baptist Church. I don't have to prove a thing, the angel says to you. What God said will happen. Right. Now listen to me. You say amen and all your pious wonderfulness. No offense that you said amen. <laughs> but listen to me. Listen to me. God's word is chucked full of promises to the believer. 
Do you believe that just because he said it, you don't have to prove it, you don't have to do it my way, you don't have to have a flaming angel in front of me, but just because you said it, I will believe it and live by it. Amen. Just because you promised me this, <laughs> I know I can bank on it. I know it's definitely sure. I can write out a check on it. I can walk on it. I can make a decision on it. Your promises are true. Right. You don't have to prove them in a certain way. They are true. I don't think uh, God told you to... I don't know if God told uh, Gabriel to do it or if he just took angelic privilege, but at this point, Gabriel smites his mouth for uh, saying such a dumb thing and makes him dumb. Listen. God accomplishes the improbable anyhow. And he raises up the great prophet named John. But Zacharias, because of his doubting and skeptic, skepticism, misses the praising of the Lord of the big picture, misses that his son will be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, saving mankind. He missed the joy of being a willing tool, and he gets his mouth closed for nine months. He loses eternal rewards that would have come from faith, and he's forever known in the Bible, and I'm telling you this, Thousands of years later, he's forever known as the guy who doubted God. Folks, don't miss the joy of God working in you. Believe it and enjoy it. Believe that he is working in you and will work in you and enjoy it. He learned his lesson, though. I love it. Verse number 63, if you look in your Bibles, I love it. They came to the point of naming his son, John. He certainly had one. God said it was going to happen. He had and he come to the point of naming it. And they went and named him Zacharias Jr., all right? Or the third or whichever number it was. And, uh, you know, that's your family name. You got a name Zacharias name? You know, John said, you know, Zacharias says, you know, he calls for a tablet. Doesn't call, he motions for a tablet. You know, they had wax tablets at the time. So they put it, but he, I love his statement. He just writes on the tablet, his name is John. <laughs> I know that he was thinking, listen, buddy, I learned this the hard way. <laughs> That kid's name is John, and I'd like to talk again, so you name him John. Amen. Zacharias is you, Christian. Old Zacharias, when he said his name is John, his mouth opens, and for 13 verses he praises the Lord. Zacharias, you, Christian, when God is working, his big picture, so much bigger than you, so much bigger than your details, he includes you in on it by love, and you say, God can't work the improbable in my life. Stop looking at that silly little bill and realize that God is wrapping up time and history. God is saving the final souls. He is using you to be a part of it. He is preparing the trumpet blast. He is working in your life and through your life. God can surely accomplish the improbable little concern that you have. We are Zacharias and only looks at our ant world and misses God's great will unfolding. There's another character that we need to look at. In the end, you'll see that her name is Mary. I want you to look, please, in your Bibles, verse number 26. I'll only read a few of the verses. The Bible says in the Luke 1, 26, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And she saw him. She was troubled at his saying. And cast in her mind, what manner of salutation this should be? And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, shall bring forth a son that shall call his name Jesus. For he shall be great, and, and called, uh, sh excuse me, he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom uh, there shall be no end. Then, Mary, then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? seeing I know not a man. Six months later, poor Gabriel is called on another mission. He probably thinks, I don't know what he thought. I don't know he thought that he was going to do some more mouth smacking, or I don't know what he thought, or if he was frustrated, got to go to these faithless humans, faltering humans. Again, he goes to another person connected to the same story. I can see him flying, wondering what will happen. He finds the virgin and waits till she's all alone and delivers the news. In verse number 28, he says, Hail, hail! You that God highly favors, the Lord is with thee. You're blessed among women. Listen, all of these statements you will see are passive statements. That means they happened to Mary. It wasn't from her side of things. You need to understand that because I hear people talking of this hallmark experience of Christian. 
of Christmas, of, of like how Mary was, she was really something, so that's why God chose her. It had nothing to do with it. She was not the most godly person in the world. She was not the most godly person probably in that area, not in her town. It was not that. God was choosing her by grace. She was highly favored. God was doing this to Mary. Not that Mary had done anything. God picked her in his sovereignty. And in verse number 30, the angel says, Don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. Listen to me. That word favor is the word charis. It is the word grace. You have found grace with the Lord, just like Abraham did, just like Noah did, just like all New Testament Christians and Old Testament Christians that come to the Lord. You must come by what he does. Grace. Grace. She found grace. He said, you will conceive a son. You'll call his name Jesus. That word means what? Yell it out. Wake up, everybody. What is he? Jesus. Savior. Savior. He is the Savior. You'll be great. The son of the highest. That means the supreme son of the supreme God, Jehovah. God will give him the throne of David. Look at me. Immediately when he said that, Mary knew that she was going to bear a Messiah. There are many promises that he would be of the line of David. She knew immediately two things. She was going to bear a Messiah, and that her betrothed husband, Joseph, was in the line of David. It connected in her mind. The angel says, he, Messiah, will reign forever. That's the big picture of Christmas, folks. God becoming man to be the Savior. Mary fixed her eyes on that. Mary Amen. saw that. The great things she heard, the great things that the angel said. And just like Zachari Zach uh, Zacharias, excuse me, she asked a question. At first glance, it may seem like a similar, similar question as Zacharias, but it is a <coughs> world of difference. Mary asked this, look at this. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Let me tell you something about that. As I studied it through, how? She is saying, in what way shall this be? Not skepticism, but belief. Lord, how are you going to do this? Well, that's great. How are you going to do this? Seeing that I know not a man, the word is translated in the King James Version and, and several other places, husband. Seeing that I know not a husband. Know not a husband. The difference is this. Zacharias said, prove it to me. I don't believe it. Mary said, how are you going to do it? Or in what way are you going to do this thing? Zacharias' response was focused on the improbable. Mary was focused on faith that God can do anything. She was asking, in what way, Lord, are you going to do this? It was great in her eyes. The angel earlier had talked about the throne of David. And betrothed jo jo Joseph, as I just told you, was in the line of David. It may well be, listen to me, I'm not saying it is, it may well be that when Mary was asking, because she just heard what the angel said is, do you want me to go ahead and marry Joseph and make it happen? Since he is the line of David? This was response of faith, people. One thing we know for sure, God knew that she was answering from a heart of faith. And Gabriel wouldn't be smiting her unbelieving mouth. He would answer her with respect and praise to God. This was not laughing Sarah in the tent. This was not Zacharias with a doubtful answer. This was an answer from a faith-filled heart. God blessed it. He said, the Holy Ghost will come to your womb, Mary. And the power of the highest, supreme God, will overshadow thee. Overshadow thee like a big old tree in a sunny day. That casts a shadow, you're going to be under the shadow of Almighty God. That holy thing is born in you, shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing, literally, that holy one, Jesus, is the Son of God in your womb by the Holy Spirit. He tells her of barren cousin Elizabeth, who now is six months preg pregnant. This is the big pond in which Mary is just a little fish. It is explained that God will do the impossible. She, a virgin, will conceive the Savior of the world. And listen, what was her response? She just believes. Different times in your life, God has impressed you to do something for Him. Perhaps you went through a time of doubting and wondering and skepticism. Can I tell you? With that impression on your heart, look at, look at me. Come on. By faith, you need to say, that's you, Lord. That's not my flesh telling me to be involved in the ministry. That's not your flesh telling me, my flesh telling me to walk across the road and witness to somebody, to bring up the matter of the gospel at work, to, to sing for the church. That's not my flesh telling me that. That is certainly you, Lord. The Bible says that if a man desired the office of a bishop, a pastor, 
desire the good work. What's that mean? That desire is proof that the Lord is working on the heart. That burden is God's calling. Please understand here that this was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And in verse number 37, please see it. It points that to, to both the conversation of Zacharias and Mary. It is the point of this message. It explains the great redemption of mankind by God becoming a little baby. It screams for you and I to believe on your daily life. With God, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. Christmas is about the impossible. Holy God coming to love you, a sinful man. Amen. Nothing. Look at verse number 37, right in your Bible there. Because I don't think you're getting this. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. You know, there's not a hint of question mark in the angel. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Of course nothing is impossible with God. What you think like an angel today? Nothing's impossible. The Lord lays a burden on your heart. I can't do that. It won't work out. Nothing's impossible, God. Amen. Can't build that building on the corner. We need five hundred thousand dollars to build it. Nothing's impossible, God. Can't start a ministry. Can't witness that person. It's not my personality. Nothing's impossible, God. Nothing. Can't get a new job. Can't change the way I've been for so long. Can't pay my college bill. Can't do this, can't do that. Can't get back with my wife. Can't can't do this stuff. Can't raise my kid. He's going astray. When you read verse 37, think like an angel. The Bible says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Certainly talking about the salvation incarnation of Christmas, certainly talking about that, but applying to Zacharias and Mary at this point. Won't you guys learn? God's using you. He is creating the impossible, but he doesn't dump buckets. He does it through people. Unbeliever, can I tell you today that by that little baby and future suffering man of the cross, God died for every sin you've ever committed, no matter how rotten you've been. Doesn't matter if you've been involved in demonism, if you have burnt a Bible, if you've blasphemed God. Doesn't matter if you've killed a man, cussed, lied, or none of the above, if you're the greatest grandmother in the place. Would you understand that God will save you if you admit that you're a sinner and you must be saved outside of yourself? Right. We realize that's what Christmas is about. The baby who would grow up to die on the cross for you. One day Jesus and the disciples were having a conversation. There was a rich man, they were talking about him. And he said, you know, it's easier. Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go into heaven. And that was strange in their mind because they considered at that point rich men blessed by God. They were the most holy because God obviously was financially blessing them the most. And then the, the response was just off the cuff. They said, who then can be saved? And Jesus says this, with man it's not possible. Right. But with God, all things are possible. He says verse number 37 to them. And there, maybe there's somebody in the room and you really don't think God can save you. Perhaps you got caught in hyper-Calvinism. You've been listening to the family radio too much and you think the door of opportunity for your salvation has closed. God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. Amen. And sup with him and he with me. A verse that is really to Christians but has definite salvation implications. Listen to me. If you call out on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Amen. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I've gone to a church a lot. I've had this religious experience, this religious experience. You must be born again. Amen. You know, I was thinking about that, you know, the stories in the New Testament about how people were born again. You know, they were born again right on the spot. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were saved. Right. The jail, the Philippian jailer, he got saved right on the spot. The Ethiopian eunuch got saved right on the spot. There are others that probably struggled a lot with the vastness of their sin. The 3,000 that Peter preached to were saved right on the spot. Here's your spot this morning to be saved. Amen. You need to call on the Lord Jesus Christ. In a few moments, I'm going to give you that opportunity. 
The lesson, the second application is to you Christians. Mary's final answer to Gabriel is the great answer of faith when God asks you to trust him and to follow. Though uh, things may seem improbable in your life, things may seem impossible, she says two things and we're done. Look at verse number 38, please. The Bible says, And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. What was she saying? First of all, she said, Behold, or look at me. God, I'm your handmaid. Do you know what that means? A handmaid's a female slave. <clears throat> Mary was not looking at the impossibleness of her womb. She was not looking at what it would take through the scorn and the grief of raising the Son of God. You know what she was looking at? God's agenda. God's business. She said, you pull it off, I'll be your slave. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm here, I'm your slave, whatever. Christian, get your eyes off of God doing something for you, him being your slave, and become his slave, and the improbabilities and the impossibilities will be accomplished according to his will. God, I am your slave. Use me, command me. Let me serve your great picture somehow. You know, our obsession with our problems in this life is a result of wanting God to serve us. If we would but trust him and make ourselves his slave to his agenda, then all these things would be added unto us. That's right. We're so worried about what God will not do in our life, that we're not looking and we're not focusing our life on what he is doing. You know, I kind of have the idea that God pays his servants. I kind of have the idea that if you would become a slave to his will and to his agenda, that he'd take care of you. Secondly, she said, be it unto me according to thy word. She said, I believe it. Let it happen just the way you say it. This is a statement of great belief and submission. She believed God's word through the angel. She said, let it happen. That's great. Let it happen. Let it happen. And friends, this morning all across the room, Christians who know Jesus Christ without a doubt, need to surrender their will. Lord, I'll be your slave. And whatever you say in your great agenda, let it happen. Let it happen through me. Whatever you want me to go, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. I will not be skeptical when you lay something on my heart. I will follow it. I will try to make it happen. Lord, tell me who to talk to about Jesus. Tell me what track to hand out. Please tell me. Tell me what ministry that I should join. I'm not going to wait around. When I get a burden on my heart, I'm going to serve you, Lord. Tell me what I should do, where I should send my kids to school, how, what job I should have. I'll look through thy word. I'll look at your word. I'll look at your word. Listen, visions don't come through angels now. He's written that precious word. You better get your nose in it. I'll do it. I'll do it. When you lay a burden on my heart, I will do it. I'll do it. I'm your slave, Lord. Stop thinking, God won't do this in my life, and start thinking, Lord, I believe what you promised. You know how to give good gifts to your children. Your arm is not short. Your ear is not deaf. Your timing is always per perfect. You will supply all my needs. I'm going to be, some, be very honest with you. God will be stuffed in your box. may sound strange to you, but in my life, if I think that the money should be here at 4 o'clock, it doesn't show up till 5 o'clock. I think God is teaching me, it's not how you do things, it's the way I do things. If I think, oh, it's got to, you know, I used to go in, in college to, uh, to my box, uh, my mailbox, I hear about all these other, other college kids that are getting their bills paid for and, you know, nothing, you know. I'd open up my mailbox and be, chirp, chirp. Near the dust. <laughs> Nobody sent me care packages. Nobody liked me. Except for that twenty dollars that my want mom used to send me every week. There it would be. I'd pray on the way. I thought if I pray harder, it would work better. <laughs> send me. I believed. I believed. It's going to be there. If I tell somebody it's going to be there, then I'll make it there. I know. Because I'm going to my mailbox. I know. My bills will get paid. I go. A little slip in there for what? A little slip. Got in trouble when you go to DMM's office. <laughs> <laughs> Put that back in the mailbox. Listen, God's not going to be stuck in your box. He'll do things the way that He wants to do them. You get on His train, not you, not Him on your train. 
You say, God, I am your slave. Do it according to thy word, according to thy will. I'm, I have faith that you're going to do it. I'm not going to have skepticism and doubt. I'm not going to look at my body. I'm not going to say, prove it to me. I'm just going to believe. I'm going to believe. Friends, this morning I close on this one day before Christmas. God can do the improbable and the impossible. Will you be a merry Christian and stop being a Zacharias Christian? Bow your heads, please.